So, it has been a little while since my last confession, otherwise known as my YouTube videos. Welcome to the Flying Doctor channel. My last video went out in June, would you believe? And since then, life has done what life does. I have changed jobs, moved house, I've had a few curveballs, and most of all, I've been reminded that time doesn't always run to schedule. What has been hugely encouraging, though, is how people have still been finding the channel, are still subscribing, are still watching, and that means so much. Now, over Christmas, I finally had the headspace to return to something I've wanted to get right for a long time, virtual reality in flight simulation. And I'll be honest, the first time I tried VR, I wasn't convinced. It wasn't straightforward, it wasn't plug and play, and for a while I genuinely wondered whether I'd shelled out for something that was more hassle than it was worth. But now, well, now that it's clicked, I genuinely think that what is on offer here is extraordinary and suitable and accessible for far more people than it was before. If you're new to VR or curious but hesitant, this video is for you because once it works, VR is truly amazing. Welcome to the Flying Doctor channel. Let's geek into it. Before we go any further, let's just clear something up. This is what tripped me up right at the beginning. There are broadly three ways that virtual reality works. First, standalone VR where the headset runs the games itself. You don't need a PC, you just need a headset, not even a games console. That's why some headsets have internal storage. Second, VR can work as an add-on to consoles or closed systems, and that's more limited. And then third, and this is what we're talking about today, PC virtual reality, where the headset is essentially a window into what your computer is rendering. In PC VR, the power comes from the PC, not the headset. You don't need lots of storage on the headset, and you don't need to understand everything on day one. Now, for context, I'm using a second-hand Quest 3. Fantastic value if you can still get hold of them. Nothing exotic on the one hand, but more than enough to get started. And just to say it out loud, don't go for the Quest S, the Quest 3S. The Quest 3 is the one to aim for if you can, if you can still get it. But there's plenty of other choices out there and plenty of other commentators who can give advice. The second thing I want to say is that virtual reality in Microsoft Flight Simulator feels very confusing. Most people will have come from a 2D perspective, no pun intended there. But in 2D, we chase frame rate, but in virtual reality, we're looking for stability. And then we're looking for quality of visuals. And then after that, we might be thinking about frame rate. When you're assessing VR, you're really thinking first, looking through your headset, thinking, how does this feel? Am I comfortable? And oddly enough, you can be at 100% GPU usage and have a great experience, albeit 70%, and things feel awful. There still is a fair amount of tweaking to do. However, it's got more like plug and play, but there's a tweaker's paradise out there if you're geeky like me. The difference is in frame pacing, not in raw, raw numbers. And once I understood that, everything else started to make sense. So how did I approach things? Well, I used Heathrow as a stress test. I tested almost everything at Heathrow because, in my view, if, if a setting survives Heathrow, it survives anywhere. There are other places. The other place that I went to was London City Airport, uh, using the Orbix add-ons as well. So use something that you know is going to absolutely max out your system that you're perhaps already struggling with at 2D and use that as a stress test to assess what's possible in virtual reality. Terminals, jetways, AI traffic, lighting, it is the worst case scenario. And even very powerful GPUs will hit their limits here. That doesn't mean something is broken, it just means you're finding the edge. One other area where I found I was totally confused for a moment 
was where the virtual reality actually comes from. Because there isn't just one way to connect, say, a Quest 3 headset to a PC. There are two completely different pipelines. The first, which comes with your headset, is something called Meta Horizon Link. That's the software you install on your PC, and it's there in the headset, and it allows the PC to connect to the headset either by a USB 3 cable, spend some time making sure you get the right USB 3 cable, you really want a USB-C link straight into the back of the motherboard, or there's the opportunity to connect things wirelessly over your home network. If you do use it wirelessly though, your PC needs to be connected to your router by Ethernet. Wi-Fi from the PC itself is not reliable enough. Now, the second option is Virtual Desktop. And yes, confusingly, this is an app that lives inside the headset. So you order it inside the headset. Think about the headset as being a second PC, which is talking to another PC. It lives inside the headset. Well, not anyway, but then that talks to a small streamer app that runs on the PC. So you purchase Virtual Desktop through the headset. You'll go through some steps to be able to do that. You'll have to form an account with Horizon. You purchase Virtual Desktop. It gives you the software in the headset and it will send you a link and you install the software online on your desktop. Now, Virtual Desktop is wireless only. So yes, an app in the headset, talking to an app in a PC, launching a SIM that then talks back to the headset. Yeah, welcome to VR. Honest, it has got a lot easier and a lot more pug and play, but um, there you go. Now, here's for the surprises. Like a lot of people, I assumed a wired connection would obviously be better, but with a good router, ideally Wi-Fi 6, wireless VR can actually run at higher effective resolutions and feel just as stable. That genuinely surprised me. Wireless also removes the cable pulling at the headset, which makes long sessions far more comfortable. And wired isn't wrong, it's just, and wireless isn't magic, but the key is understanding which pipeline you're using because the settings don't always translate between them. And I would recommend if you are going to get a VR headset, search about some of the more comfortable straps that are available and think about a battery pack. But we've not really got time to talk about that right now. So once you understand the pipeline, the high versus ultra question that appears in the desktop streaming menu, that makes sense even more. It is a bit confusing because the app on the PC for desktop streaming gives you some options and then there's other options you need to complete within the headset. So yes, slightly confusing, but workable. But you have these options within the headset of choosing high or ultra or even godlike. Now, ultra doesn't just make things sharper, it increases internal resolution and encoding load. That's fine in cruise or scenic flying, but at big airports it can push everything right to the edge. And what finally worked for me was this. High for airports and cities and ultra as something to experiment with later once you're airborne. Godlike? Hmm, not really sure. We'll wait, we'll see. But high isn't a compromise, it's a choice. But I can see that in certain applications, such as scenic flights from small regional airports, uh, high is going to be less effective than ultra, so I might use ultra there, but otherwise I stick to high. It Again, it is a compromise, but we need to get our heads around the fact that what we're being offered as simmers is not necessarily possible for the machines that we are running. And I'm running a decent setup, a 4080 Super and a 16 core AMD processor. I stuck with high. So what actually fixed things for me? That's, it wasn't broken in the first instance, I would say. There are lots of VR apps out there, and I did spend some time thinking, is my headset working okay? But don't forget how challenging Flight Simulator is. What stabilised things wasn't one magic switch. It was removing the noise, turning off dynamic settings, 
using a sensible headset refresh rate, not forcing reprojection on spacewalk, not end up doing things twice. So the app might be doing it and then the headset might be doing it. Bad news. And accepting that object detail costs more than resolution at busy airports. And once the pipeline was stable, everything else fell into place. An interesting observation about the graphics processing in a GPU graphics card. At one point, I was convinced something was not quite right because whatever settings I had it on, the GPU kept hitting 100%. Admittedly, I was floating around um, high, ultra, godlike. But here's the key thing. A GPU at 100% or even more can be perfectly fine in VR. What I would say though is you need to slow down, sit in the cockpit, give it a minute or so for the GPU to settle. What matters more than anything is not your GPU load, but whether the image stays stable and whether when you turn your head everything is nice and clear and you don't get any large black missed frames. Once I stopped chasing numbers and started judging how it felt, everything began to click. The turning point was not when the numbers improved, it was when the sim felt calm. London flew beautifully, the cockpit was readable, head movement felt locked to the world. And at that point, chasing more sharpness would have been the wrong move. VR isn't about perfection, it's about balance. So my advice for people thinking about getting into VR, I would say now is the time to throw yourself into it. It is an absolute game changer, and I'm using a second-hand Quest 3 headset. I found that it has totally changed the way in which it feels like when I am flying in the sim. So it's not just looking around and seeing things in three dimensions, just looking into a cockpit, which is moving enough. It's not just seeing the visual objects next to the runway as you're taxiing it. It's things also like seeing a, the depth of perspective as you are landing much more clearly. I found this when I was flying helicopters as well, when I was using VR before. Um, you see perspective and depth much clearer and also I do feel that you can feel some sensations such as the wind buffeting the aircraft and moving you off course a lot clearer as well. So you're trading in I think the kind of minuscule sharpness that you get in 4k if you're aiming for that and tweaking all your settings high up in 2d for a totally different experience it's like comparing two completely different things chalk and cheese they're both they're both well what are they they're completely different <laughs> i can't really compare them obviously i think that's the whole point anyway um yes you can't really compare them but i would say if your first experience has felt frustrating, there's a lot of help there. It's completely normal. Everyone goes through it. Stick with it. It is worth it. So by way of goodbye, folks, I'll put a summary of the key points and settings in the description. If this video helped, please feel free to like or subscribe. And if you've been wrestling with VR, I hope this saves you some time and frustration. There's definitely some early advice on how VR works. It sounds simple, but saves you a lot of head scratching. Thanks for watching. Take care and stay safe. God bless, folks.